Good afternoon, everybody. We're thrilled you could make it today um, to see Travis Atkins. So we're really excited to have him here with us today. Um, one of the, the big shortfalls in our offerings has been courses on Africa. Um, and so we're very lucky that Travis will be uh, teaching or offering an Africa-focused course over the summer for the full summer semester on Wednesdays. So if you like what you hear today, please sign up. And if you can't sign up this summer and you have friends who are interested, please let them know. Um, but he's been in the field um, working on development, conflict, conflict resolution um, for many years, um, both on the Hill um, and several NGOs at the UN. So he has just an incredible breadth and depth of experience. Um, so please turn your attention to him today. He's going to talk about Sudan regional security and U.S. foreign policy. Um, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. But again, we're just really thrilled that he could join us today. So Travis. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, thank you for showing up. Thank you for eating in my face as I <laughs> sit here wishing I could join you guys. Um, I think Rebecca said it all, and so I think I'll dive right into this. Um, and I don't think that it's prudent to begin to speak about any individual African nation without trying to put the whole context, or the, excuse me, the whole continent into a specific context. And so I wanted to start just with the vastness of Africa and some of the things about the continent that really make it a macrocosm of the microcosms that are its individual nations, right? And so we look at Africa, a continent of 11.7 .7 million square miles, right? 3,000 different ethnic groups, 2,000 plus uh, languages that are being spoken, all of this taking place in 54 nations with a population of about 1.3 billion people. And if you look at this map, one of the other things you'll see that makes all of Africa a, a micro, a macrocosm, excuse me, for the country of Sudan is a few things that I'll go through um, as we as we move along here. One, it's immense size, right? Two, the massive number of um, population groups there, languages spoken there, right? this idea of Sudan as a nation that is divided, right? Arab and Muslim and desertist in the north, just like the continent of Africa. Savannah, uh, green, rich, resource wealth um, in the south. And uh, hopefully at some point, I won't cover it much in the talk, but we can get into a discussion about even the divisions among people in Africa, right? This whole notion that there is a such thing as sub-Saharan Africa. Middle East and North Africa, right? These designations that separate the continent based on cultural designations uh, and population groups, right? Uh, and if you guys have read enough, I'm sure you've come across a term called black Africans, right? Which is also an oddity in the way that um, the African populace and people are, are designated. And so I think the first couple of things we want to discuss is what are the main historical themes that have shaped the people in the continent of Africa that have led to the kind of political outcomes, development outcomes, economic outcomes that we see there in 2019? The first one of those is this. It is the Arab slash Indian Ocean and the transatlantic slave trade, right? These two epics of history created a situation of massive depopulation um, on the continent. The Arab slave trade lasted over a thousand years uh, and in some ways ran concurrently with the transatlantic slave trade which lasted about 400 years. And so what you're talking about there is a depeopling of Africa, of the African continent that you didn't see in any other continent in the world. And as I'm sure you guys know, they did not come and take children. They did not come and take elderly, they came and they took the strongest, the most healthy, the youngest, you know, the target kind of population group in terms of fertility and other things of that nature. And the resources that were in the labor and the vitality of those people were then taken out of Africa and taken into the places that those people uh, were taken to, uh, namely the Western Hemisphere and through the Middle East uh, into Asia. Uh, one of the key differences I would uh, note there 
that if you think about the Western Hemisphere, you think about places like Brazil or even the United States or the Caribbean islands, right? You look and you see phenotypically African people everywhere that you turn. But if you go into the Middle East, you don't see that as much. And there's a very specific reason why, because of the process of enslavement that the Arabs were taking versus what was happening in the West. And that is that in the Arab slave trade, they preferred to have African men as soldiers, right? And so frontline soldiers fighting wars, being killed off, right? And then on top of that, many of those men were made into eunuchs, right? So they were castrated and not able to reproduce. And then you have millions of African women going into the Middle East area as concubines, as house servants, as sex slaves, right? And so then what you end up having is a population that is the progeny of Arab men and African women. So if you go throughout the Middle East region, you will sometimes see people and you say, oh man, this is like an Afro-Arab mixture, but you don't see as many so-called black or African people phenotypically in that region. And that's one of the reasons why, even though that slave trade was twice as long as the one that brought uh, African populations to the Western Hemisphere. Following that, you leave this map of Africa that is boundless and you move into the political map of Africa, which is essentially a creation of the European period of colonization on the continent. And so in 1884, of course, the Berlin Conference, European powers making decisions about how they would carve up the continent so that they wouldn't be fighting um, in Africa over territory, right? So the French and the British are dividing territory in, in West and East Africa, right? The Italians and the French dividing territory in North Africa and so forth. Um, and so that epic of history, 1870s into the 1900s, um, was essentially a time period where African nations were divided into artificial borders, right? These borders were, gave no credence to pre-existing relationships between peoples, right? So a border could put you into a category with a group you were at war with and divide you from your family members who lived on the other side of the border. The other uh, impact that the colonization period had was that it also created many nations, and you can look at this map and see, many that are too large to be effectively administered, many that are too small to actually be economically viable. One of the things it also created was a continent that has the most landlocked nations of any country on the planet at 14, right? And so you have nations that were shaped uh, externally with arbitrary borders that were not uh, organically produced by the people who live there, with governance structures that they inherited that included um, non-democratic racialized caste systems essentially right so no country no African nation that came into power um, inherited a democratic system right in fact in a colony you are subject rather than a citizen and unfortunately too many of those trends um, have continued on the uh, on the continent so Bearing all of that in mind, let, let's, move, let's move to the Sudan. Uh, and this idea that I told you about Sudan as a microcosm of the larger macrocosm of Africa, and you can see it immediately, right? You see immense size. You see the difference between the north and the south. And one of the things that I want you guys to be thinking about is the kinds of comparisons and contrasts that create conflict right they could create diversity they could create strength but the history has been that they have created conflict and so you see an arab i mean excuse me an arid desertous north with a rich um and green south right so there's a stark divide there then the arab culture and islamic religion predominates in the north right and people even though if they were in the united states you might consider them African-American, but the racial um, caste and categories in Sudan is such that people have been Arabized through continual trading, through continual intermarriage and intermixture with 
of Arab populations. And so you'll see many people who may not be phenotypically Arab uh, calling themselves after that designation and seeing it as superior to being called an African, right? And so that's a moment to take and say the original um, Arabic name of the country, Bilad al Sudan. Bilad, B I L A D, al Sudan, right? Which means the land of the blacks, right? And that name was given to them by Arabs who, of course, did not see themselves as black. So they were named as outside, from, from outsiders um, in, their, in their own nation. And really quickly, I'll give you about a 30 second run on about 200 years of history um, in, that, in, in, that, in, that, in that region. Um, the territory that we now know as Sudan and South Sudan was controlled under the Ottoman Empire initially. Uh, and then it moved from the Ottoman Empire to Egyptian rule. Uh, from Egyptian rule, it then moved to British rule, or what they call the Anglo-Egyptian condominium, which was this idea that the British and the Egyptians would administer Sudan uh, together. But in effect, uh, the British administered the country um, at that time. And the key thing to remember out of all of that, I don't expect you guys to go and be experts on the Ottoman Empire, but the key thing to remember out of all of that is that the Ottoman Empire, the Egyptians, the British, and then the first independence government of Sudan all view the southern part of the country as a place that did not deserve to be developed as a people who could be uh, enslaved and taken advantage of. Uh, in Arabic, they call it the Dar al Harab, the Dar al Harab, right? The abode of war. And the idea was that in the Dar al Islam, right, the place of peace, the, the haven of Islam, you could not affront another Muslim by enslaving them or robbing them or pillaging them. But that in the Dar al Harab, you had the right in the faith to take advantage of people who would be considered disbelievers. And so, essentially, for two centuries, you had Arab populations enslaving. Um, black South Sudanese, right? Um, and one of the things that made this uh, an additional challenge was that the British essentially administered the Sudan as two separate countries even before they were separated. So in the 1920s, they had what they called the closed door ordinances, the closed door ordinances. And what those order ordinances uh, instructed was that if you were living in South Sudan, you could not travel and trade in and go back and forth to the north. And that if you were living in the northern part of Sudan, you could not trade and travel and go back and forth into the south. Then they decided we will allow uh, English to predominate in the south and we will bring missionaries from the UK to teach there, to teach Christianity, to teach English. But in the north, we will allow Islam to continue to flourish we will allow Arabic to continue to be the lingua, lingua franca. And we believe, this is the British uh, administration at this time, we believe that the Arab population of the North is more advanced and more prepared to enter into the modern world versus the backwards infidels or the backward disbelievers and heathens of Southern Sudan. And they administered it that way from 1899 to 1956. And at the time of independence, they decided, hey, let's just throw it all together again. How many of you guys think that was gonna lead to a great outcome? <laughs> no, not at all, right? In fact, they were so adamant that it should be separate that they actually had a plan to make the southern part of Sudan um, combined with, I believe, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania and they were gonna just call it British East Africa, right? As opposed to having it connected to the northern part uh, of Sudan. And those plans didn't work out. And essentially what happened is that Southerners in Sudan realized that the year before independence, that the governments in the north were not going to represent their interests, did in fact see them as inferior subject peoples. And so what happened <coughs> 
moving into kind of this notion of the conflict, uh, the, the long tenure of conflict in Sudan, is that actually a civil war broke out in Sudan in 1955. The reason that's important is because Sudan did not come to its formal independence until January the 1st, 1956. So the, it's this odd situation of a nation that is in civil war before it actually even becomes a formal nation. And what that means is that this nation was born in chaos, was born in violence over this notion of who would control the country, what would be the identity of the country, what would be the direction of the country. And in the 60 some odd years that the nation has been independent, they've had the first civil war was from 1955 to 1972. They had a brief period of peace from 1972 to 1983. They had the second civil war from 1983 to 2005. And so essentially the default political context or status of Sudan is war, right? And it's based on all of the historical factors uh, that I've laid out for you guys so far. Um, I should also say that um, the central themes of Sudan's history really do revolve around identity, conflict, resource wealth, great resource wealth, and a lack of distribution for that wealth, right? And so these Arabized governments in Khartoum from the very beginning of their independence were basically saying, look, we want to be seen as an Arab Muslim Republic. Here's the problem. At that time, Sudan was 40 million people, the unified Sudan, 26 million of them jet black Africans who wanted nothing to do with Arab identity, right? The other 14 million in Khartoum and its environs were saying, no, this is where we want to go. And so they essentially came up with a program that was called the process of Arabization, right? Which means they wanted to impose Arab culture, Arab language, Arab cultural mores and styles of dress on this mass population who, though many of them were Muslim, they did not want to be Arabs because that is not how they uh, defined themselves. And so you have decades of history where the conflict was, we're going to marginalize you, we don't accept you uh, for who you are, we will take all the resource wealth from the rich areas, but we will only use it to develop the areas that uh, the Arab populations lived in. One thing to point out too, that's interesting about this map in terms of security and conflict, is that one of the reasons that Southern Sudan was so underdeveloped, other than the history, was that in all of their civil wars, what they say in Sudan is that the Arabs, um, had the military might, but they were not good fighters and they didn't have strong morale. But that the Africans were great fighters who had strong morale, but they were too poor to be able to get strong weaponry. And so what that creates is what? A stalemate, right? People who can't fight but have weaponry and people who can fight but don't have as much weaponry. And the reason that Southern Sudan was destroyed is because the North had an air force. So they could project their power into the South. The South didn't have an air force. So even though they're calling it a civil war, essentially all of it happened in um, the southern part of, uh, of Sudan. And so I'll move from there to kind of what all of this war and conflict has meant, right? And how that relates to regional security throughout throughout the continent. So you look at Sudan again, a country too large to be administered, massively diverse, no respect for its diversity, with immense resource wealth that's only being used for a certain population while another population is being marginalized. So there, there was the big war between the North and South. But who has heard of Darfur? All of you, I'm sure, right? So in Darfur, the same situation, a group of people who considered themselves to be Africans, who said that they were being marginalized by the government, and then the government decided, let's have a campaign of proxy war against this region of people who are rebelling against the government. Now, 
here's where the lie was given because the, the, the conflict in Sudan had been framed as Muslims against non-Muslims. But when the government came against the people of Darfur, the people of Darfur are 99 percent Muslim. But in that case, this kind of racialized um, discrimination uh, was brought to the fore. And so you had Sudan at war with the South. You had Sudan at war with its West. You had Sudan at war with its central region called Southern Kordofan in the Nuba Mountains, where there were genocides in the early 1990s. And so essentially, it is a, a nation where the center is at war with all of its peripheries, right? Which was an untenable uh, situation. And so now I want to move a little bit into what that means for regional security in, um, in, in the Horn of Africa, the greater Horn of Africa, right? So one of the first things that happens when you have successive wars is what? Can anybody tell me? What's one of the first things? What do people do? They leave, right? They leave, right? So you have a massive outflow of what? Refugees, right? And where are those refugees going to go? They're going to go to the neighboring countries, right? Now, Sudan, in its unified state, as you can see here, bordered by nine different nations, all of whom are, are in various states of flux themselves, various states of conflict themselves. So if you can imagine, I mean, it's funny, when I was growing up, you know, if two or three extra people came over for dinner, it was going to be a problem, right? Because we didn't have enough to feed all of those people. So imagine distressed countries with porous borders and weak governance receiving millions of people on their doorstep from these other conflicts, right? So Sudan becomes a concern because it is exacerbating uh, the stability of the other countries um, in the region. Uh, the other thing I should say, though, in terms of this idea of regional stability and security is that many of the countries that Sudanese uh, refugees were going into were also sending refugees into Sudan, right? So when you look at this Horn of Africa region, I want you to think of it as a very complex web of nations that have deep connections to one another. So Sudan and South Sudan are in a, in a, in a war for 30 years. Sudanese refugees are going into Uganda, Ethiopia, Chad, Egypt, right? But also remember that Ethiopia and Eritrea are having a civil war. And guess what? Eritrean refugees are going into Sudan. Ethiopian refugees are going into Sudan. Chad is having multiple conflicts. Refugees from Chad are going into Sudan. And guess who they're passing by on their way? People from Sudan who are going to Chad, right? And so this complex web creates a very dangerous mix uh, for the people uh, in those regions. And one of the things that I should say in, in relation to that is about the brinksmanship between governments in the, in the Horn of Africa, right? And this idea of proxy militias and influencing negatively uh, your neighbors for your benefit. So to give you an example, Sudan was in conflict with the government of Ethiopia. So to one up the government of Ethiopia, guess what they did? They provided armaments and support to who? Refugees. The Eritreans. Because the Eritreans wanted what? Independence from Ethiopia. And so Ethiopia said, oh, okay, you think you're slick. Guess what we're going to do? <laughs> guess what we're going to do? Who, who did Ethiopia then fund and support? The South Sudanese who wanted what? Independence from Sudan, right? Then you have the now deceased leader Muammar Gaddafi in Libya who had been meddling in Sudan and having aspirations of conquering territories in Chad and Sudan for decades, right? So then Libya and Gaddafi's folks are uh, meddling in the western part of Sudan that is Darfur. And there is a very long history that you guys should look into that I won't go into here now of Gaddafi funding what is called uh, these pan-Arab legions. These pan-Arab legions, which were groups of militias who had this idea of Arab supremacy, right? Who knows what the Janjaweed is? Anybody know the Janjaweed? 
The Janjaweed were the militia in the Darfur region who were, who were responsible for the atrocities committed against the people of Darfur. They were Arabized um, nomads, essentially, who were used by the government of Sudan to do their dirty work to put down the insurgencies in Darfur. To give you a, a small Arabic lesson, uh, in Arabic, jinn is uh, like evil spirits, right? And jawad is a horse. Jin jawad, John jaweed, right? Becomes John jaweed. And essentially it meant evil men on horseback, right? Because that's how those militias would come into the villages of Darfur to attack people with this Arab supremacist ideology, right? So almost like the Klan or hate groups, if you, if you would imagine in the Western context, I bring them up because they were funded, backed, and supported by Muammar Gaddafi to do what? Create chaos inside of, inside of, uh, of Sudan. Additionally, on this regional security front, the president of uh, Uganda, Yoweri Museveni, was arch enemies, is arch enemies, with Omar el-Bashir, the president of Sudan. The reason that he is an enemy of him, which was the reason that many were enemies of the Sudanese regime, is because the Sudanese regime had an Islamist agenda, which means they wanted to radicalize young Muslims all throughout the region, right? And if you think about Ethiopia, it is basically called um, an island of Christianity in a sea of Islam, right? This is how Western policymakers see it. The mistake that Western policymakers make, though, is that actually Ethiopia is 50% Muslim. So actually, this idea of it as a as a um, island of Christianity is wrong. But the reason why they were concerned is because, again, who wants to have radicalized Islamic elements in their country? Mostly no one, right? And so the fact that Sudan was doing this made them inimical to almost all of their of their neighbors. Uh, I'll do one more on this regional front. Uh, let's 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 talk about Egypt, right? Egypt, the formal colonial power in Sudan. What is the most vital thing to Egypt in this Horn of Africa region? Who can tell me? The Nile. The Nile River. Why? Uh, well, for farming, for irrigation, also for hydropower. Absolutely. And it flows upstream. And it flows upstream, right? And to put a cap on both of what uh, these folks are saying. Egypt gets 90% of all of its water from the Nile River, which means it's essentially the Nile is its only source of life. Now, to, to, to the gentlewoman's point, it flows upstream, but the Nile runs through about six different countries, right? And these are some of the poorest countries in the world. The reason that Egypt is so involved in what is happening in the country south of it is because it needs to protect what? It's access to the Nile. And one of the most contentious issues in the Horn of Africa security wise is that the Sudan and Egypt signed in 1959 essentially a kind of, uh, well the first one was 1929 then another one came in 59 but the original one was signed under the colonial period when none of the nations south of Egypt were free and independent to fight for themselves. And what that agreement said was that um, Egypt was to receive about 55.8 billion or 55.5 billion cubic meters of the water that flows upstream from the Nile and that Sudan would take, I think, 18.5, right? And that meant that all of these poor nations who couldn't feed their people, couldn't irrigate their own uh, crops, they had to watch as the longest river in the world flowed right by them because that water was meant for who? Egypt. The Egyptians. And if you tried to build a dam, if you took out more than a certain share of water, what would Egypt see that as? Uh, an act of war, exactly, because for them it really is life and death. And the justification they have is one, the colonial agreement. The second part of their justification 
is only that they uh, it's only that they don't receive the rainfall that Sub-Saharan or, or the, the country south of, of Egypt do, which is also not very much and it's not very dependable. So this is the excuse um, that they're making. And so I wanted to give you a sense not only of the internal challenges inside Sudan, but the fact that it is in a tough neighborhood where countries have their own issues, right? Somalia, no government for what, 20, 30 years almost. Uh, Ethiopia coming out of civil war with uh, Eritrea, Chad simply being Chad, Central, Af <laughs> Central African Republic, right, conflict, Democratic Republic of Congo, conflict, Uganda coming out of civil war, right, so this is um, the way in which you guys can kind of conceptualize a whole region uh, and the relationships between the countries um, that, are, that are there. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was this issue of climate and conflict, right? So if you looked at the Darfur conflict, um, it was real, essentially a conflict between nomadic peoples who were pastoralists, herding animals, and sedentary farming people. And the challenge that they had was that over time, this process of desertification, where the Sahara is coming further south, right, each year. And so it became a much more fierce competition for resources. And so seasonally, these pastoralists would come through a certain region of this long strip called the Sahel, right? Who knows what the Sahel is? Anybody? Yes. Yes and no. That, that's close. Sahel in Arabic means the shore, the shore, right? And so if you look at this, you can kind of see the conception uh, of that, that, you know, the, the, this green band across Africa is land or the shore, and then this massive desert comes out from it. So the Sahel is not just the countries below that band, but it's that whole band where the Sahara meets the savannah. And so the reason why I was going hard on this macrocosm, microcosm, is because that band does not just exist in Sudan, right? That band uh, exists over Chad and Nigeria and Niger, right? So this coming together of different populations of people um, under climate stress, where if you come through my village with your camels and I'm not producing the yields that I used to produce, and then I come outside and your animals are eating the food that's for my family, I'm gonna have what? A, a problem, right? Now, then don't forget, post-Cold War, Africa is flooded with small arms and light weapons, right? So whereas we used to have uh, systems of customary uh, redress of grievances, of sharing, of this pattern of seasonal uh, migration, all of that is beginning to break down because now I can just take it from you because I have arms and you don't. And so I want you guys to be thinking about always the roots of conflict when you're seeing a news story or you're reading something um, in a book because oftentimes they will just say herders against pastoralists, Christians against Muslims, black people against Arabs, but it's usually much, much deeper than that. And it's almost always about some form of power, whether it be resource wealth, land acquisition, um, and the like. Uh, moving from there, before we get into our Q&A, just wanted to go into um, kind of U.S. foreign policy interest in the region and how some of those things have played out over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, in most of you guys' lifetime, I would bet, and I was small when the kind of anti-apartheid movement for South Africa was a big deal in the United States, right? And so I would argue that the only other African nation that has created the kind of civil society um, uh, fervor uh, is Sudan, right? The Save Darfur Coalition, Not On Our Watch, this notion of, you know, George Clooney and folks like that being involved in, in Sudan and this becoming an issue on co college campuses all over the nation and in churches and so forth because the, essentially the United States 
had been deeply invested in Sudan. So in the 1970s and 80s, uh, the United States, Sudan was one of the largest recipients of aid uh, from the United States. And essentially what happened is they stopped paying back some external loans that they had and they started to carry out these atrocities and it became very difficult for the United States to continue to support um, the governments in Sudan who were basically hosting um, um, Islamic terrorist groups, right? The PLO was there, Hezbollah was there for uh, several years. Osama bin Laden was hosted by the government of Sudan. And if you if you recall, uh, in 1998, President Clinton actually bombed two sites in Khartoum over this idea of Sudan's links to terror, right? And to this day, they're still on the state sponsor of terror list because it was known that not only were they hosting uh, global jihadists essentially from all over the world, but the mission of their government was to spread Islamism as a political ideology throughout their region. And so the U.S. basically wanted to uh, maintain regional stability uh, in Sudan and the Horn of Africa, wanted to staunch um, massive atrocities and genocides, uh, and then also wanted to stop the rise of, 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 global, of global terror. Now, one of the ways in which that played out was that they actually had a security relationship with the government of Sudan. And so in the early 2000s, there were many policy arguments about some of the trade-offs that the United States was actually making with the government of Sudan, right? So in exchange for things like information on the bin Laden family or al-Qaeda operatives in the region or other terrorist networks that were operating in the Horn of Africa, hey, you know what? We'll just give you a slap on the wrist for what you're doing to the people of South Sudan. Or, you know, we'll just give rhetoric and then do humanitarian assistance on Darfur because we don't want to lose this kind of security cooperation relationship, right? And this is something that civil society actors uh, protested vociferously um, in the U.S. Congress um, and other and other places. Now that also has a long history because before I believe his name was Chris Stevens or Chris Stevens' son, that the U.S. ambassador that was killed in in, in Benghazi. Well, before he passed away, tragically, the last U.S. ambassador to be killed anywhere in the world was 1974 in Sudan. And so this gives you a sense, and that, I believe that was a PLO operation, and so it gives you a sense of really the threat uh, in terms of global terror that Sudan, um, that Sudan had caused. And that led the United States into basically this decades-long kind of carrot and stick relationship with Sudan and what it proved I think to us and to many in the world is that our leverage actually wasn't that great right because we could say you should stop you should stop doing this to your population okay well what are the mechanisms by which we can cause that to happen right you have sanctions but there are many uh, other partners in the world who would still trade with Sudan. And if you know anything about the resource wealth of Sudan, one interesting anecdote is that they are the world's number one producer of a thing called gum Arabic. And even though it may not ring a bell immediately, if any of you were to look on the back of a Coke can or a candy wrapper or your shampoo bottle, you would see this ingredient, gum Arabic. And the United States business community was so adamant about having this ingredient that when the, there was a time when in the early 2000s, the Sudan was the most heavily sanctioned nation by the United States in the world, above Iran, above any other nation. Guess what they left off the list of sanctioned products from Sudan, right? They left off gum Arabic because the lobbyists on Capitol Hill from Coca-Cola, from the shampoo companies, from the candy companies said, look, we know that it's wrong what they're doing to their own people, but if you sanction them in this way, you'll actually be destroying American business interests, right? And so there's a complex series of things that that we need to look at uh, when we think uh, about that relationship. Go ahead. Uh, just for the sake of clarity, could you just give a little bit about 
how the actual government of Sudan works and the yeah. form that that is. Then the, the government of Sudan, could you go into that just a little bit? About sure. How they or sure, you know? sure. So, so the current government of Sudan took power in a coup. The National Congress Party took power in a coup in 1989. 1989. And so essentially what they developed was an Islamist system of patronage, right? So it's basically a group of elite uh, Muslim ideologues from specific families inside Sudan who are the primary business owners um, in the nation, who run the ports, who run um, the oil industry and so forth before the separation of South Sudan from uh, the Sudan and who have essentially uh, carried out proxy war throughout the nation um, to maintain their power in the capital for the duration of the time that they've been in power now, 30, 30 years, right? And so that's essentially the way that they, um, that they have operated. Um, one of the things I should say too that's really interesting is this idea of what a proxy war is, right? And this ability to be able to co-opt different elements of the population to fight against others. And so one of the, and, and even in the United States, this is true. One of the best ways for poor and undereducated people to rise in any society join the military, right? And so what you had at the time of the war with Sudan and its southern region was a Sudanese armed forces that was filled with soldiers from Darfur, right? And soldiers from Darfur are actually the ones who led the assault on the people of South Sudan, right? And the reason why that's important is because you can imagine then how the people of South Sudan felt when the government of Sudan was attacking the people of Darfur, right? So you would think there could be this immediate sympathy, but in many quarters they were saying, well, no, these are the people who killed our mothers, our fathers, burned our villages. And what that does in terms of how the government op operates in another aspect, this divide and rule tactic, is it, um, it makes it very difficult for coalitions to form that are strong to then push back against the government as a whole. So what you have is a, a nation in conflict that has essentially been divided against itself um, even from before the time that it was independent. Uh, and yeah, we can move to Q and A now, please. I'm not coming to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for talking to us today. Um, what kind of Chinese investment is there in North and or in Sudan and South Sudan? Mm -hmm. And do you view it as being a stabilizing or destabilizing influence in the near term and in the long term? Yeah, good, great question. Um, China has been involved in Sudan for a very long time, probably two or three decades now. And when the United States sanctioned um, U.S. oil companies against working in Sudan, it was essentially China who then filled that gap. And so China was essentially running uh, the national oil companies um, in the Sudan. Now, the destabilizing part of that, which is essentially the brunt of it, is that, as most of you know, China has this kind of non-interventionist policy, right? That we will cooperate with you and we don't get involved in your internal affairs. And so essentially what China was doing was basically funding the military of Sudan to carry out atrocities against its own people. So basically that, you give me a check for oil, I give that check to the Ministry of Defense, that ends up in bullets and bombs going into bodies across uh, the nation. So I would say writ large, certainly uh, destabilizing. Uh, but also something that is a kind of microcosm, right? There's this debate in Washington now about China in Africa, Chinese competition with the United States and Africa, uh, and Sudan has certainly been a recipient of it, as well as as well as Russia um, in Sudan, producing the bullets, producing the planes. Like when you see uh, Sudanese military forces coming into a region, it's almost all um, Russian material. Yes. Um, when you were talking about the Arab slave trade using Africans predominantly as, as soldiers, it kind of struck me because right now there are like 10 to 15,000 yes. Sudanese yes. fighting for the UAE exactly. and for Saudi and Yemen. Exactly. I'm curious where they're recruiting them from, if they're predominantly Arab or if they're predominantly um, black or if yeah. they are 
um, how, how much the government's involved? Because I know right. money is exchanging hands and Absolutely. Like, looking the other way. But. Absolutely. So the government is essentially selling these these young young people, renting them out, right? And it's an interesting question because one of the things I would challenge you guys to look at is these ideas of identity, right? Because the thing about um, the thing about Darfur is that when you say Arab and you say African, if you I'm sitting in this chair. If you imagine another person look that looked just like me sitting in this chair, I'm saying I'm black. He's saying he's Arab. That's essentially what it is, right? Because it's not really a racial designation. It's a designation about the language you speak, the culture you have, the way in which you make a living, right? Are you a nomad? Are you a pastoralist? Are you a farmer? Um, and if you were to go into Darfur, and I, I should have brought pictures from Darfur, but you look it up, if you saw any of these people on the campus of Georgetown, you would not immediately say, oh, there's an Arab gentleman or there's an Arab young woman, right? They all look... Um, African phenotype or so-called black. And um, these young men are mostly from the Darfur region and they're the same uh, young men or related to the young men who in you know, 10, 15 years ago were the militias that were doing the damage in, uh, in Darfur. And so essentially they're pulling them from there because the thing about militias in Darfur and almost anywhere is that they are just as destitute as the people that they are recruited to take advantage of. And that's what makes them readily recruitable, right? So kill or be killed kind of mentality. Um, and it's just a fascinating thing to see that the government of Sudan is still co-opting them. And by co-opting them, one, they are taking out a volatile element from their own society. They're making money off of it. And then many of these young people are being killed when they go to Yemen. Uh, and so it's a, it's a tragic state of affairs, but it is a perfect kind of anecdote as to the care and concern that, the, that this particular government of Sudan has had for its own citizen. Yes. You've shown very, very well that uh, Sudan is a microcosm to the macrocosm. And in the case of Sudan, the, the result of the arbitrary borders was a split. What do you see for as a future for other African countries like maybe Nigeria that also have uh, you know, torn across ethnic lines? Do you mm -hmm. see something similar happening? Do you see where we draw the borders? Yeah, one of it's, it's a great question. Um, who knows what the Organization for African Unity is? The Organization for African Unity is founded in Ethiopia in 1963. It is the precursor to the African Union, right? The precursor to the African Union. Essentially, if I were to use a uh, uh, just layman's terms, European colonialism made a mess of the continent of Africa. And the Organization of African Unity was the first continent-wide body that said, look, we've got to clean up this mess. To your question, one of the first things they had to decide was, what in the world are we going to do with all of these arbitrary, inorganic borders that were created by outside powers? Now, they made a, a tough decision, but I think the right decision in a way, right? If you tried to redraw every border in Africa in 1963, there would have been wars everywhere. And so the principle was that even though these borders are externally created and arbitrary, keeping them will allow us to have more stability than trying to redraw all of them. However, keeping those borders did keep some stability in most cases, but there are two instances where keeping those countries together created more conflict. One was Ethiopia and Eritrea. The other was Sudan and South Sudan. But they both had to fight the Ethiopia and Eritrea 30 years of war before the AU said, look, we got to separate these guys. Sudan, South Sudan, 50 years of war and bloodshed and refugees and destruction before the AU said, look, we got to separate these guys. So the, the bent of the African Union is for territorial integrity and for allowing um, nations to stay within the borders that they are. And the reason why, you can imagine, right? You can imagine if one group gets it, well, hey, we, we want independence too. Hey, what about us in this small corner of Cameroon? Or what about the people in some small place in Zambia or Zimbabwe?
right? Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to set a precedent like that because you do have separatist movements uh, across the continent. Um, fortunately or unfortunately for themselves or their governments, they don't have the ability to gather enough force uh, to create a serious problem in those nations. Uh, and certainly the AU and other African governments would not promote this idea of rampant um, bifurcation, separation, secession of nations for in the sake of uh, regional stability. Yes, sir. But then on, on the other hand, every nation and, and in the term of a ethnicity, not of a sovereign nation, uh, has got the right to self-determination under the ICJ. So how do you counterbalance that with the, with the decision in, in 63 that uh, we keep the borders as colonial borders yes. just to, to keep the stability? Well, I think it depends on what you define by nation. I, the ICJ doesn't define a nation as just a group of people, right? They're talking about nation states, right? So there is a difference between a nation and a state, right? But this is, this is really the key difference. If you look at European state formation versus African state formation, right? In, Fran in France, they speak what? In Spain, they speak what? In Italy, they speak what? In England, they speak what? In Portugal, they speak what? Portuguese. What's the language of Ghana? What's the language of Kenya? What's the language of Sudan? What's the language of Zimbabwe? Saying that to say that in Europe, states formed around nations, right? That's why when they say the Germanic people, right? That is to say the people were German before there was Germany, right? The people were Spaniards before there was Spain right people were Greek that's why they named the land Greek they didn't get their name from the land they gave their name to the land right so it gives you this distinction now you look at Africa and you say okay in the West when Western nations came to power there were there weren't all of these conventions and global norms around human rights around governance around the treatment of women and children and ethnic minorities and so Lots of terrible things happened, but as Africa has come into its independence um, phase, all of these things do exist. And so you have a lot of piling on on these nations while they're in their nascent states of development. But most African nations are only 60 years old, right? But if you take the United States, 1776 plus 60 is what, 1836? What was the status of women in the United States, 1836? Ethnic minorities, 1836. Who had the right to vote, 1836. Treatment of the poor, 1836. Right. So when you look at African nations, it's not to give them a pass. It's not to say that these things are okay because they're young nations. But it is to say that if you want to be a pragmatic policymaker, you have to realize the history and trajectory of a nation, and you have to realize where they are in the course of their development. It doesn't mean you don't you don't apply pressure. It doesn't mean you're not tough in your foreign policy negotiation, but it does mean that they're not going to go from the Arab slave trade to the transatlantic slave trade to colonialism to neo-colonialism directly into representative democratic governance. It's not a reality and no nation who's there now got there that way. So it's, it's, really, it's really impractical to think of Africa uh, in a way that would it would move in that way, right? So, yes, in the back, I think you had. Your yeah, question. my question was an extension of the conflict in Yemen and Sudan's role there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very limited English language literature on who the people fighting um, yeah. are. Are these crack elite troops? Are these people pulled from villages and given a gun and told to fight for the government? Um, what is the? I guess I'm rephrasing the same question. What are the social dynamics? Who are the people that mm -hmm. are that are that are choosing or not choosing? Yeah. To leave Sudan to go fight yeah. in Yemen. They're, they're definitely not. Mm -hmm. I don't, there's no such thing in Sudan as a crack elite troop. Let, right. let, let me just let me just say that first, right? So we talked about this this use of proxy proxy war, mm -hmm. and one of the challenges of proxy war is that you're basically paying somebody to fight your battle, mm -hmm. right? Which means they're not fighting because they believe in your cause. They're fighting because what? You're paying, them, right? And so when the funds dry up, guess what also dries up? Their willingness to fight on your behalf. And again, that's, that's a pretty raw deal, 
right? And so you have to think that these are populations of people who don't have much opportunity, who don't have much in the way uh, of education, who are living a, generally a subsistence or a, a nomadic and subsistence lifestyle, right? And that's why they were so easy to co-opt when they were the proxy militias that were attacking the people of Darfur. Because essentially what they said was, the government said to them, hey, you're Arabs and we're Arabs, and we have to cleanse our nation of these black people who are insurgents. And in fact, in Darfur, they did not pay their proxy militias. What they said to them is, your pay will be to take what they have and push them out, right? Because they wanted to basically change the demography of a whole region of their country. And they did this on this false connection of Arabness, Arab identity working together to push out another group of people when the fact was that the government was taking advantage of the African identified Darfurians as well as the Arab identified Darfurians. And so they were both the losers. Yes. Um, and apologies if I butcher this name, but the the uh, Mawari Dam, um, the, the the major dam that opened in two thousand nine. Ethiopia. Oh, the. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, but but I'm wondering how how has that affected um, politics along the Nile mm -hmm. in the last decade since it's been open? Because I because I know that's been a flashpoint kind of between um, actually between Ethiopia and Sudan. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it it's a huge it's a huge problem, and there was a an incident several years ago where the foreign, I think the Minister of Defense actually of Egypt was on a television show and they went to break and we see this sometimes in the US, they go to break but they, they, they go away kind of slow so you still see the people and they start talking and laughing but you can't hear what they're saying. So this guy's on a hot mic and he basically is talking about starting a war with Ethiopia if they move forward with building this dam, right? And the Ethiopians um, are a regional military force in and of themselves. No match for Egypt. However, they're basically saying, one thing I didn't tell you, you'll go research this more. 85% of the water flow that goes into the Nile comes from Ethiopia. So not only, they're not just on the way to Egypt, almost all of the Nile water actually starts in the highlands of, of their own country. And so they made the decision to do the dam. And there were a series of conversations and negotiations over years for them to prove the ways in which it could be done without being a life-threatening thing um, to the economy and to the agricultural and to the people of Egypt. But it's far from a resolved issue. Um, and what it has done is it has encouraged other people who live in uh, riverine um, countries along the Nile, they call them riparian, um, the nations along the Nile, um, for them to get their fair share as well. And so it's something that we will have to continue continue to watch. Just, just to supplement that, and you can tell them the energy water next to Yeah. Um, so how, how does pollution also fit into that factor? I mean, is that something that Egypt's actually concerned with now, or, or are they looking to the future on that? Huh? It's a great question, because if any of you have ever been to Cairo, I mean, it's like being in Los Angeles. You, you, sometimes you can't see your hand in front of your face. So when you talk about pollution, right, it would be, uh, it would be pretty rich for Cairo to be talking about pollution <laughs> in anything given, their, uh, given the status of their country. But I have not seen many reports of that kind of thing. And it, and it, it is a granular kind of thing because their main thing is to make sure that the water flows the quality of it becomes, you know, kind of a, a, of another thing. Anybody from this side? Yes. Good question. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the Avia area dispute. Yes. Um, particularly, I know the UN is on the brink of drawing down their troops there. Yeah. And I'm wondering what you think, if anything, the U.S. might be able to do yeah. or the AU to prevent Great all question. conflict. Great question. So who knows what Avia is? Who knows what Kashmir is? You know, Kashmir? Kashmir? Okay. Well... I'm not one to draw too many comparisons from different places in the world and put them in other places. Like you see reports, oh, this is Eritrea is the North Korea of Africa. No, it's not. Eritrea is the Eritrea of Africa. It's not the North Korea of Africa. But I only say that to say 
Kashmir, a disputed region between India and Pakistan. Abia, a disputed region between Sudan and South Sudan. And it's a territory that's basically called, they call it the bridge between the North and the South. Uh, 1915, um, or in the, in the early 1900s, under the British, this actually was known to be a part of Southern Sudan. It was administered as a part of Southern Sudan. In 1915, a chief in Abia decided that for the safety and protection of his people, he would not cede the territory of Abia. But what he said was, we will allow it to be administered by the North, right? Administered as this legal designation versus annexed and becoming part of, of, a, of a separate territory, right? So at that point, you can see this is going to end up being a problem, right? And then what happened, because it was a bridge, it also became a frontier where um, the Civil War was fought between the North and South. And so then you get into not only is it a resource rich area in terms of oil, but then it also takes on symbolic value. Right. If I were to come up to you and take your backpack and we're pulling it back and forth and we're pulling it back and forth. And when somebody comes to break us up, whoever they hand the backpack to did what? Won the fight. Right. They won. Now, that her backpack could be empty. Right. But it means something to her because it belongs to her. Right. And so this idea uh, of Abia as this symbolic territory that would decide who won the war. And they knew that the, the government of Sudan, they knew that uh, many Southerners had a sympathetic connection to it because their families were from there. And they felt that if they got there, imagine getting separated from your loved ones, right? So if Sudan, if South Sudan was a parent and Abia was a baby, right? We're going to separate, but we're going to snatch right this territory away from you. Um, and it has been a hot button issue ever since the separation of Sudan and, and South Sudan in January. I'm mean, excuse me, July 9th, 2011. Um, and I'm not I'm not uh, optimistic uh, about what will happen there because I think both Sudan and South Sudan are both mired in multiple conflicts. And Abia at this point is more symbolic than it is a place that's on fire. Uh, and usually, if you're in a place that's on fire. Your focus is where? On the fire, right? Not the places that are not. And so it's a historic hotspot, but it's not a current hotspot. So I don't see how that gets back up to the top of the list of policymakers uh, to deal with. At the time of the separation, it was a huge issue because it was thought that whoever was given IBA uh, could cause the two sides to go back into war. And fortunately, that that didn't happen, but then they both went into war in their own new separate countries. And so basically Sudan has not changed at all, right? And what Sudan is, to give you guys a, a story from Sudan, I, I was in a meeting once with an elder from a village and he said, this is this thing about identity, the nation state, this artificial container. He said, there is no such thing as Sudan. There is only North, south east and west and essentially what he was saying is there's no national identity there's no cohesion in this nation it is the government itself against all of the regions and so when you split off the south of sudan guess what it's still the government of sudan against all of the regions and so that dynamic um has not changed and that is the central issue uh, in Sudan and now in South Sudan where many of southern Sudanese are saying hey The government of South Sudan you're treating us. They would say you're treating us worse than the Arabs, right? Meaning you're treating us worse than the government of, of Khartoum, right? Because There's a, a very difficult dynamic that you guys will see if you're studying Africa and other parts of the world of any revolutionary military fighting force that comes into governance, right? And that idea, the challenge of making the transition between getting everything you want by way of the gun and then moving into a space of negotiation and consultation and representative governance, right? And most nations that have that, uh, in, especially in the short term, they don't do 
they don't do very well. And so, you know, what I've always said is that the independence of South Sudan is, is it wasn't for the people who were alive when it became independent, right? It was for future generations, right? If I was in America, 1776, I wouldn't be here speaking to you guys, right? I'd be in a completely different um, condition, right? So it took time for things like this to happen and it'll take time for things like that to happen in places like South Sudan. Yes? Do you have any thoughts on the current protests in Yes, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. Do you, do you think it's possible for a popular movement like that on its own to replace Bashir or will there need to be like a coup or yeah, something else? Yeah, that's that's, it's, a, it's a great question. So right now, I've given you an hour on all these wars that have happened in Sudan and how none of them have overthrown the government, right? So imagine the irony of his question that peaceful protests would somehow be able to do what bullets and guns have not been able to do. But this is something that we've seen happen in places before. And I can tell you that what people are saying to me in Sudan and from Sudan is that this time is different. Right. They've had these popular peaceful protests before, but people are starting to realize their power, not in terms of the ability to fight, but in terms that poor everyday people are the ones who actually make the nation go. Right. And so take a quick example from here. Our government shutdown probably would have kept going. But guess what? Air traffic controllers just said, I'm not going to work today. I can't keep going and not getting paid. And guess what? That same day the government reopened, right? So people realizing this idea of just the power of them being who they are. Um, and it is causing different calculations to happen inside the government of Sudan. Because remember, first, the government is at war in every region of the country. Second, they're surrounded by protests in the capital. Third, the president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, is indicted by the International Criminal Court. So he's bounded on all sides and on the top, right? His travel is restricted, right? He could try to go somewhere and get taken to The Hague. Um, so there's almost no way out, right? But this is the savvy of the National Congress Party and the Sudanese government that for 30 years, they've been dealing with situations just like this and always finding a way to snake out of it. Um, and one of those ways could be that they remove him, right? And one of the things that we should be careful about, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in South America, South America, whether it's in Africa, U.S. Uh, foreign policy makers tend to focus on the boogeyman, Bin Laden, you know, uh, uh, Maduro, Osama, Osama, uh, the Saddam Hussein, right? But you'll note that if you remove every one of these individuals, right, that we've been taught to see a certain way, sometimes the people behind them are worse than they are, right? And at the very least, nothing changes. You look at the situation in Zimbabwe, Emerson Minanagua, president that came after Mugabe, and everybody who knows, knows he literally is a clone of Robert Mugabe. He's Mugabe 2.0, right? So you celebrate, Mugabe's gone, yeah! No, because the guy after him that they, he's younger than Mugabe, he's 80, <laughs> right? Mugabe's 97. Now we got a guy that's 80 after him, right? And so it's that kind of, it's that kind of dynamic. So people are hopeful. Uh, and one thing I can say, and we know this for all protests, that if a protest has 500 people, and you kill 50 people, sometimes nobody shows up the next day and the protest is over. If a protest has 500 people, you kill 50 people and a thousand people show up the next day, you're in trouble, right? And that's the kind of thing we're seeing um, in the Sudan right now. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, given with that, the Russian admission that there are you know, thousands of mercenaries now working with the Sudanese military, mm -hmm. uh, do you foresee a way for international pressure to actually work uh, to aid these protests or to help stabilize, or would it just kind of expand that proxy war to yeah. 
You know, this is a this is a this is a great question because I think one of the challenges in, in U.S. foreign policy is that we are a nation of people that have a, a can-do attitude, right? Which is great. The the only problem is there actually are things that you can't do, right? Or that you can't do at the cost that you're willing to pay, right? So that's when we start talking about, well, we want to do it, but it would take boots on the ground, so no, right? Blood and treasure, right? And the challenge with Sudan is that the leverage that we think we have hasn't been able to work. Whether it's sanctions, whether it's the state sponsor of terrorists, whether it's you know forcing the nation into a pariah status, it hasn't worked because their main goal is not to be a friend of the United States. Their main goal is for their regime to survive. And whatever it takes to do that is what they, uh, is what they have been doing. And so I always say to colleagues, to myself, to students, you know, we ought to really look at what are the limits um, of American power? What are the mechanisms of our foreign policy? You know, this idea of carrots and sticks. And sometimes we can do things and sometimes we can't. Right. And listen, these folks um, have long memories, are very savvy and have a deep awareness and knowledge of history. Right. And so don't think that the Sudan government doesn't see what happens when uh, Mohammed bin Salman in uh, Saudi Arabia kills the journalist. Right. Or other nations have human rights. But you didn't say that to them. Right. When I go to Sudan, and it's a different cultural experience, they say, well, how can they talk to us about hu human rights? Look what happened to your people, right? So they know, right? They know. And I think this is, becomes part uh, of, of the problem. Give you another example on that. Just north of Sudan, I, I was in Egypt with a congressional delegation about, uh, about three years ago. And we were meeting with President Sisi and this delegation was railing on him about his treatment of, uh, of protesters, killing them, killing protesters, basically. And he smiled. And you're just like, wow, this dude is, this is chilling. Like, he's smiling while they're talking to him about killing protesters. So I knew he was going to say something that he thought was, was smart. And he said, uh, you, you come here to, to, my, to my country. You talk to me about the murder of protesters but what about Ferguson and he said that then he said it the day he said it Ferguson Missouri was on fire National Guard tanks were out tear gas was been being put on citizens and so it's a new it's a new day right because people know our history and they know our our current now the the reason that the blow didn't land as hard as he thought that it would is because our delegation was actually uh, a congressional black caucus delegation. So he thought he would catch them in hypocrisy. But if you have a room of 10, 75 year old black people, they all grew up <laughs> in you know that time. And so it's very difficult to have a moral uh, leg up on people that come from that kind of that kind of treatment. And so what they ended up saying to him was they said Exactly. And that's why we don't want it to happen here. And then it kind of changed the conversation. But it's this whole idea of, you know, what we say to other people, uh, what we do um, in our own country, and then how that impacts our ability or inability to change um, their behavior. Because ultimately, with all of the stuff around sovereignty versus the responsibility to protect, if you're actually going to to be true about it, that means you have to be willing to invade people's countries, right? To start wars that may kill more people than the thing you were invading the country for. Quick example on that, I went to Sudan in 2004. I was working for Save the Children and this was part of the first wave of humanitarians that were allowed into, into Sudan. And um, the day, the same day I got there was the day that Colin Powell, when he was Secretary of State, was testifying on Capitol Hill, and he said the, the United States government, through the State Department, designates the situation in Sudan as a genocide. Right? Full stop. Then, three sentences later, he basically said, however, 
Okay, see, I see your faces. When you say genocide, they can't, however, cannot be the word that comes after genocide. But what he was essentially saying was that does not um, initiate on our part any responsibility to be engaged um, beyond a certain way. So there is this tension between the sovereignty of a state and its ability to murder uh, and kill its own, um, its own citizens without repercussion. Right. But as you can see in Darfur, that's exactly what the government did. And there was no one who could do anything about it. Right. When we got there, the only reason that we were allowed to come. First of all, first of all, this is the thing about humanitarian assistance. We have to ask the government, excuse me, government of Sudan, these people that you're killing, can, can we come and help them? Sure. Come on. <laughs> right. They clean these mass graves up. We come in. People are in terrible conditions. And um, all we can do is band-aids, right? So we go to a camp one day, you're working with people, clean water, this, that, and the other. You go back to the village the next day, you're looking for all these people that you were with the day before, and they say, oh, the, the militia came and killed them last night, right? You've been working with these people for three weeks, and they're all gone. And you just go to another camp, and it happens again. And in these camps, you wouldn't even, um, often the male population had been decimated or was off fighting a war. We went into one camp and I saw all these men, like 100, 200 men. I'm like, man, there's plenty of men in this camp. And they said, no, there's 80,000 people in this camp. These are all the men, right? But when you saw them together, you thought, oh, wow, there's men everywhere. And so those were the kinds of uh, uh, dynamics there. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not real hopeful about anything um, that we can do being a driving force, right? Like we give ourselves credit for the independence of South Sudan, right? Yeah, we supported it, but guess what the people of South Sudan did? They fought, died, and killed for 200 years. So it's, it's odd to say that we did it. <laughs> no, they did it, um, and we supported them in, in doing so. Um, before we close, um, and let me know if you guys have any other questions, but I wanted you guys to see this really. Oh, I, I should have split to this when I was talking about the U.S. phone policy. But I wanted you guys to see this because one of the reasons I am here um, today is because right now I'm teaching in the African Studies program. Uh, I will be joining the Security Studies program this summer, uh, and I'm going to be teaching a course called U.S. Africa Policy. And so one of the things I wanted to do is just give... A sample talk and lesson um, and hope that you guys um, will join me and, and know folks who will join uh, who are interested in Africa in this program and all of the relationships between the US and security across the continent. Uh, another thing that will help answer a lot of the questions that, that you guys have is that I am the creator and host of a podcast called the On Africa podcast. This is uh, my cover art for the show. And my last four shows have actually been on Sudan. I just had uh, a show with uh, a Sudanese uh, scholar on the current protest in Sudan. And before that, I had a three-part show with Ambassador Susan Page, who was the first U.S. ambassador to South Sudan at its independence um, in 2011. But the entire show um, is about politics and governance uh, and security issues in Africa. Uh, and then obviously my Twitter there at Travis middle initial L last name Atkins um, happy to answer any more questions if we have time if we don't I'll be around as you guys uh, take off and just want to thank you guys for joining